you might think that this uh, being Lent and all, that uh, we would be focused tonight on our shortcomings. And for those of you who actually did decide this Lent to, to be involved in the what you might give up or take on, um, you might be ready already to confess ever more sincerely, we have sinned by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Um, especially if you gave up chocolate only to discover that Valentine's Day was Ash Wednesday. <laughs> Ouch, that hurts. Well, it's not that Lent isn't about penance and denial and emptiness and remorse, but we are also focused tonight on God's amazing love for us, too. Tonight we have one of those marvelous stories in Genesis. It's the story of the covenant that God made with Noah and the whole creation after the flood. It is, in a sense, the new creation, the reordering of God's creation. Now, of course, the story of the flood itself has a lot to do with God judging humankind and finding it wanting. The sin born from Adam and Eve's first decision to leave God in the dust and to strike out on their own is, as the Bible makes abundantly clear, repeated in every generation until we read in Genesis chapter 6, verse 5. The Lord saw that the wickedness of humankind was great in the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. And then some of the most poignant words in scripture follow. And the Lord was sorry that he had made humankind on the earth and it grieved him to his heart. And God's answer, of course, as we know, is to bring destruction, to reverse the first creation when God separated the chaotic waters. It's a scary story, the story of the flood. It never fails to amaze me why it seems to be so popular to domesticize this, to make it, to make it a children's tale. So we have little coloring books and little toys with stuffed animals to the tunes of Noah's Arky Arky that he made with Barky Barky or something. The story that the Bible actually tells is terrifying. What are we to make of a God who creates all things, who in the beginning declares that everything in creation, including people, is very good? who's depicted as a God who tenderly molds us from the dust and walks in the garden. This is the same God who drowns all living things on earth, with the exception of Noah and his family, and the animals brought on the ark, two by two. I think it's very important for us to remember that to enter into the stories of Genesis is not to read it as history or science as we might think of that in our own day and time, but rather to learn the story of God, to learn the story of this whole amazing creation. The flood story is a story of God's grieving heart in the face of what humanity has done. And right there, that might give us a moment to pause and reflect on what we are doing to creation today. In this day, the threat of nuclear war to annihilate everyone in a flash, or the slower pace of climate change sinking us because of our careless disregard of God's good earth. When we read Genesis, it's not so much a story that explains the past that's done. It is a story that is meant to sweep us up and point us to God's future. The story of Noah and the flood is a story of God's torn heart, but it's also a story of God's tender heart. It tells us that no matter how just God is, no matter how deserving this creation is of obliteration, God can't quite give up on life. This is why in the story Noah has been preserved. It says in the Bible that Noah was a righteous man. But the Bible, being ever so honest, also tells us that he had a fondness for wine and that after the waters receded, he staggered on to dry land, got drunk, and his children saw his nakedness. 
In other words, the new creation God envisions even after the flood is still tainted with sin. As Martin Copenhaver puts it, something was smuggled on board with them, tucked away in their hearts, and that is the seed of violence. He suggests, and we know he's right, that it grew like a weed, and that even today is in us, even in the good guys. Sin and violence, he said, are nestled in the genes. But of course, we know that's a sad story. That is our story of reality. It is how we all sin, and to our shame, even our children witness some of it. The sad story. But tonight, as I said, we also have some very good news, and that's God's surprising part of the story, the second act. God promises, after the flood, to never do it again. God says, I established my covenant with you that never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of a flood. And never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. The God of all power and might who can in righteous judgment condemn the world, this God now chooses another path. In the face of our violence, our disregard of creation and one another, God makes a covenant to suffer the blows, to grieve, but not to destroy. And the bow in the sky is the sign of the warrior. But this beautiful bow, the rainbow at the end of the storm, will be, according to God's word, a reminder note to God never to bring about complete destruction. God says that when the rainbow appears, I will remember. I see. We'll be taking a look at other covenants on these Wednesday evenings as we gather here in Lent. Covenants that are made with God's chosen people in the weeks ahead. But this first covenant, God's covenant with Noah, it's not only with a select people, but all people, even all creation, all the animals, every living creature, God says, that is with you, the birds, the domestic animals, and every animal on the earth with you. God's promise means that God is so helplessly in love with creation, with the whole creation, that God won't give up. God chooses to suffer with and for us. This is the testimony of the prophets that despite our sin, God's persistent abiding love continues. God's suffering love should not come as any surprise to us. We are gathered here tonight for what other reason? Because God's Son loved us to death. This church, this place, is where we're meant to gather in every season. We look to find a place of honesty and truth-telling, because we know and proclaim that God is faithful and forgiving and always reaching out to us, starting with Noah, God promises never again. Never again will God give us up on us no matter what waters rise against us, no matter the destruction that we bring upon us. God will rescue us from whatever flood of woe we find ourselves in, and while the rainbow, as the Bible says, is to remind God of this promise, I think that we too are meant to look up and remember as well. Thanks be to God. Amen.